Welcome, and thank you for joining Day Ahead Market Overview Session Number 2. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx participant and chat panel by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note that all audio connections are muted at this time. We will not be taking chat questions. To ask a question, please press pound 2 on your telephone keypad. You will hear notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, then please state your name as well as your question. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I will turn the conference over to Stacy Crowley, Vice President of External and Customer Affairs. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Stacey Crowley. Thank you again for joining us for the Day Ahead Market Overview, the second session. I know uh, we will likely have folks um, on the line here that were able to join us on last Wednesday for the first session, and I know we do have some new folks um, attending this session as well. So welcome to all of you. Um, we look forward to um, a good discussion and good questions throughout the, um, I think, two and a half hours that we have blocked out. Um, and again, appreciate you all taking the time to participate in this discussion about day ahead market details. Um, today's discussion uh, dives deeper into the concept behind the day ahead market from what we discussed last Wednesday. I would like to turn it over to Commissioner Lisa Tani from Oregon to provide some opening remarks. Thank you so much, Stacy. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'd also like to welcome everyone back and welcome those of you who are joining us uh, just for this session. The first session will be posted uh, in the next day or so on the EIM Bosser webpage so you can catch up or go back and get a refresher anytime you need. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome the EIM governing body members again who are joining us today on this learning adventure together. Um, I know we're all working to understand better how the market grapples with the day ahead and um, I'm so pleased that we're able to um, make the most of this opportunity with the CAISO staff. Uh, and also similarly extend a welcome to the WEEB board members who've been able to join us today. Um, as we saw on Wednesday, we covered several of the other of the foundational concepts for the day ahead market. I am really excited to uh, leap ahead and learn more. Um, and again, just really want to appreciate the KISO staff's efforts to take this to where uh, regulators really find themselves in this in this process, really trying to bridge from our current understanding of how utilities that we regulate, balancing authorities in our states, get set up for and plan for, and then get uh, manage the finances around being ready for tomorrow every day um, and how the market does it. And, and the, that translation exercise is really crucial as we try to lean into the promise of the efficiencies that the market could, um, could provide as we look at EDAM, EDAM uh, and that initiative. Let me leave it there and hand it back to you, Stacy. I think um, I'm excited to just get straight into the content. Thank you, Commissioner Tani. And I am going to pass it over to Cindy Hinman, who's our uh, lead trainer on this effort, and she will kick it off. Thanks, Stacy. So welcome, everybody, to the second session of our Day Ahead Market Overview. Before I start, I'm going to have everybody who's in the room introduce themselves. So, Rochelle Wiltius, manager of the Customer Readiness Team. Don Tressway, Senior Advisor, Market Design Policy. Phil Pettengill, Director for Regional Integration. Yo, Pisa, Director of Market and Action Forecasting. Nikki Imam, Regional Affairs Analyst. Duran Trina, Executive Director of Customer Service and Stakeholder Affairs. Stacey Crowley. All right. Um, so this is the second session. We had a session last week, and I know that uh, some of you may not have been at that session. We did just get the recording for that session today, so we're going to post that as soon as possible. And the slides are already available, and you'll find them on the Western EIM website on the Board of State, of, uh, Board of State Regulators page. So let us look at our agenda. Last week, we gave an overview of the purpose of 
the overview uh, and went over the agenda. We talked about the goals of the, of the day ahead market, making that plan for the next day, um, ensuring that there are enough, su enough supply to meet the demand at that time. We talked about the inputs for the day ahead market, including those bids and uh, forecasts and uh, system attributes, uh, transmission system attributes, as well as the generator attributes and the other inputs as well. And then we talked about what the market actually does. We talked about clearing supply against demand and we talked about market power mitigation and all of the features of the day ahead market. So before we move on, I just were there any big questions that you have before I before I move on to our next section? Actually, I'll introduce the next section. I'm going to stop and see if there are any questions before we before we go on. This week, we are going to get into the more complex topics of pricing. We'll talk about locational marginal pricing. We're going to talk about uh, the financial products that are associated with the day ahead market, including congestion revenue rights and convergence bidding. Then we'll talk about the outputs of the day ahead market. And we're going to wrap up with Don Trathaway is going to give us a summary of the new market initiatives that are uh, on coming up having to do with our day ahead market and potential um, upgrades and changes to that. So before I move on, I'm just going to stop and ask Marco if there are any major questions from last time. And of course, if you, if you want to ask questions now, that's fine. We also have an email address at the end of the presentation if you want to send questions later. Marco? To submit a question, press pound 2 on your telephone keypad. You, you will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, then please state your name as well as your question. Once again, pressing pound two would indicate you wish to ask a question. We have no questions at this time. All right, thank you. So in the last session, we defined the purpose of the day ahead market, and I'm just going to touch on that again briefly. So the purpose of the day ahead market is that plan. It's the assurance a day in advance that there are adequate resources available and deliverable in real time. So again, uh, to re, uh, rehash, the, uh, whether you are a balancing authority with an ISO or not, you need to make a plan for the next day um, and how you're going to serve the load. With an ISO, we developed that plan using our day ahead market, and we, looked at the, we look at the next day's bids and forecasts and all the available resources that submitted those bids. We analyzed those factors and all of the other things involved and do an optimization and come out with that plan for the next day. So in this way, our day ahead market results in an efficient unit commitment. So, Another output of the day ahead market are prices, and the prices um, provide an indication or an in of, of how the market, uh, the, the resources that will be available. So the day ahead market optimizes all of the bids and the other inputs, and it produces those quantities and prices. So prices in the market represent the are represented by locational mar marginal prices. So we call them locational marginal prices. This is a tariff definition for locational marginal pricing. So it says it's the marginal cost in dollars per megawatt hour of serving the next increment of demand at that P node. P node is a pricing node, so it's a location, consistent with existing transmission constraints and the performance characteristics of the resources. So we're going we're gonna to talk about what that means. But it's saying, what is the cost of serving the next megawatt of demand? So if we have a location and uh, we're serving 100 megawatts of load there at a certain price, what's the price if there was 101 megawatts? So and we're looking at transmission constraints and performance characteristics of the resources. So our locational marginal price is made up of three components, and the first component is energy. You'll remember this slide from last time. 
This is uh, the supply and demand curve for one hour in the day ahead market. We have all the supply bids from the least cost to the most expensive on the green line. And we have the demand bids from the most expensive to the least expensive on the blue line. Where those two cross is the total clear demand for that hour. And it also represents the market clearing price for energy. So that price is the first component of the locational marginal price. So let's look at a map just to give you a little more information. So this is a map of a part of California and all the little circles are different pricing nodes. And you can see there's a legend there with all the different, the, how the color scheme goes. Sometimes we call it the Skittles map. And, um, each node has a locational marginal price, and you can see there's three of them here that I have as an example. The one up at the top is a generation node, and the price was $10.76. You can see it's made up of the three components. The second one is a generation node in the middle there, and the locational marginal price is $6.34. And the bottom one has a locational marginal price of negative $2.30. You can see that these are made up of three components, energy, congestion, and losses. And we just showed you the energy piece, right? um, where the supply and the demand cross. It comes up with a price, and it's the price throughout the entire system, that energy price. So you can see here on all three of these nodes, the energy price is $6.15. But you can also see that the price for each of these, the locational marginal price, is different for every one of them. And what makes them different are the congestion and losses for each one of those nodes. So let's take a look next and talk about losses and what losses are. So losses, and again, I'm not an engineer, but I understand that when you inject 150 megawatts from a generator onto the transmission system, what comes out on the other end is something less than that because there's energy lost in transmission. So we model those using our full network model, which was an input to our day ahead market, and we come up with an optimal power flow solution. The loss component of the locational marginal price is based on marginal losses. So these are translated into dollars, and they're based on sensitivity factors. So that's the second component of the LMP. Let's go back to our picture again. And with our three nodes here, you can see there's a loss component for each one, and there are different amounts based on where they're located and, the, uh, and how they're calculated. The third component of the LMP or locational marginal price is congestion. And congestion is just what you might think it is. It's where the lowest price electricity can't flow freely to a specific area due to heavy use of the transmission system. So it's like traffic on the freeway. There's just not enough lanes, maybe some of them are shut down, and it causes congestion. An outcome of this is that load pays more then the generation gets paid, resulting in these what's called congestion rents. Now, we're going to go through an example so you can see what I mean by this. So reasons for congestion are lack of transmission capacity. There's not enough transmission to get the generation to serve the load. Or perhaps there's an outage. So maybe there's a transmission line that can carry a certain amount most of the time, but it has an outage and not as many megawatts can flow, causing congestion. So we're going to look at our map one more time, and then we're going to go through some examples. So here we have the congestion piece. Now, you can see there's a lot of differences in the prices here. And the first one I want you to take a look at is actually the middle one, where the congestion is zero. That indicates that at that node, there's no congestion. So the, the locational marginal price has an energy and a loss piece, and the congestion is zero, resulting in a locational marginal price of $6.34. If you look at the top, you can see that the congestion number is $4.52.53. It's a positive number. 
The positive number indicates that the node is downstream from a constraint, and the power is more valuable to the system, and increasing flow in this area alleviates system congestion. So if the LMP is positive, you're being paid um, by the market to alleviate congestion. So if you can help alleviate congestion, the, pr it will, the price will be higher. And if we're trying to discourage you from, from generating, meaning that there is congestion, the congestion component of the price could go negative. And you can see on the bottom example, the congestion is piece of the LMP is negative $8.57 causing the entire locational marginal price to be negative. So if you think about it, that generator is actually paying to generate. So they're being discouraged from generating because it's con a congested area. So let's go through an example of, of showing you how congestion works. And in our first example, there is no congestion. So here we have a very simple example, meaning that you know we have thousands of nodes on our system, and right now we're just looking at three of them. So there's a lot more interplay than what we really uh, than what we would really see. And here we have a node that has 300, meg 300 megawatts of load to be served at node three, and there's two generators: generator one and generator two. Generator one has a bid, they're bidding 500 megawatts at $40. That means every megawatt they're willing to, if the price is $40, they're willing to provide those megawatts. Generator two has a bid of 500 megawatts at $60. Now you see that um, that line from node one over to node two and three has a 1,000 megawatt transfer limit, so there's no congestion there. The, gen the generator with the lower price, the $40 generator, can serve that load with, uh, without a problem. So we're sending 300 megawatts from generator one to serve the load, and generator two is not part of this at all because we don't need that, that second higher price generator. That load serving entity or the scheduling coordinator for that load serving energy load serving entity is going to pay $40 for that energy. For each megawatt, uh, they're going to pay $40. So the LMP here is $40. There's energy. There's no congestion or losses. Generator one is also going to get paid $40. Again, there's no losses on this example, and there was no congestion because the line was not constrained at all. So it's a simple example just to set a baseline. And if you think about it, um, perhaps this load serving entity has a contract with this generator one to provide $40 of energy. They do it every day. It's, it's, a, um, it's, where it's a contract, bilateral contract that they have. So that's the expectation that every day there's going to be this $40 deal. Now let's say something happens on that line uh, from node one to node two and three, and only 150 megawatts can uh, flow on that line. So now that $40 deal is no longer going to work because you can't get all the megawatts from that first generator. So we can get 150 megawatts, so there's congestion. We can get 150 megawatts from generator one, but we're going to have to get the other 150 megawatts from generator two. So the load serving entity, if you remember I said that it's the next increment of demand, is going to set the price. So right now there's 300 uh, megawatts of load to be served. If there were 301 megawatts, we would need to get that other megawatt from generator two. So the LMP that the, uh, is $60. So the load serving entity, the scheduling coordinator for that load serving entity is going to pay $60 for every one of those 300 megawatts. Generator two is going to get paid $60 for each of their 150 megawatts. And generator one, remember there's congestion here, 
So they are going to get paid $40. There's a congestion cost there of negative $20. So if you see here, actually, so they're, they're getting paid 40 and the load is paying 60. So something doesn't seem to match up here. And let's take a look at this. If we think about it, the load is paying $18,000, right? $60 per megawatt, 300 megawatts. The load is paying $18,000. The generator, generator one, they're getting paid $6,000. They're getting paid $40 for each one of their 150 megawatts. And Gen 2 is getting paid $9,000. They're getting paid $60 for each one of their 150 megawatts. This is where congestion revenue rights comes in. So the load was charged $18,000. And the generators in total got paid $15,000. You can see there's a $3,000 difference, and that's due to congestion. So congestion revenues of $3,000. And that is allocated to congestion revenue rights holders. So we need to figure out, we, we have this um, congestion revenue, and the way that we handle dispersing that is through what we call congestion revenue rights. If this load-serving entity owned a CRR, they could potentially offset those congestion costs. So if we think back and remember that normally they had this $40 deal with that generator, um, but due to congestion, something unexpected happened, and now they have to pay more. If they had a CRR, they could potentially offset those costs with their congestion revenue rights. So entities acquire congestion revenue rights to offset their congestion costs, as I mentioned. They, can, they get them to manage congestion cost variability based on those locational marginal prices. Like the example we just showed, um, that load-serving entity ended up having to pay $3,000 in congestion costs because the line was congested. So they have, if they had uh, congestion revenue rights, they could offset that. Now, how do they get those congestion revenue rights? Well, when you become a load-serving entity, you are allocated congestion revenue rights based on the number of megawatts of load that you serve. So <coughs> we, we uh, find out how much the ISO knows how many uh, megawatts you're, um, of load you're going to serve, and you get allocated congestion revenue rights, and there's a process for doing that. We can go more into that. If you have questions about that, but we allocate them, and then if there are any left over, we auction off those congestion revenue rights. So anybody who's creditworthy then can participate in that auction process to purchase additional, the leftover congestion revenue rights. So let's go back to our example here. Remember the load, there's 150 megawatts from generator one to uh, to serve the 300 megawatts of load, and there was $3,000 in congestion rents that that load-serving entity had to pay. Now, let's look, and if they had a CRR, what would happen? This is the formula, and I'm not going to go over it, but I, I could if there's questions about it, but suffice it to say that if they had 100 megawatts of CRRs, let's just say they had 100, um, they would end up getting paid $2,000. And in our example, just going back so that you know, remember 150 megawatts transferred over uh, was from generator one to serve that load. So it's not going to be a perfect hedge, but it is going to hedge some of that $3,000 cost. So they paid $3,000. And they got a payment because they had CRRs of $2,000. So they ended up being able to hedge some of that cost uh, of that unexpected condition that, they, that came about. So I am going to go through one more slide and then I will stop and take questions. So just to summarize the whole, the whole story, of pricing, 
We have this thing called locational marginal prices, and they're used to settle the day ahead energy market. They're made up of energy congestion and losses. And the congestion costs, if there are any, are charged to the scheduling coordinators for the load, for the load serving entities. Additionally, there's something called congestion revenue rights, and they are allocated to load serving entities to offset those congestion costs. Additionally, there's opportunities to purchase CRRs through the auction process. So that is congestion revenue rights in a nutshell. So I want to open it up um, and see, Marco, if there are any questions. To ask a question, please press pound two on your telephone keypad. You will hear notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, then please state your name as well as your question. Once again, pressing pound two will indicate you wish to ask a question. We do have a question in the queue. Okay. Hi, this is Ann Rundle from Washington. Hi there. Hi, and um, one of the prior slides on the congestion revenue rights used the acronym MCC. What does that mean? Uh, the mar okay, so you're talking about down here on the bottom of the slide, that is the marginal cost of congestion. So um, as I mentioned, the, the LMP is made up of three components, and one of them is congestion, and it's actually known as the MCC, the marginal cost of congestion. So just like uh, the losses are uh, known as the, mar it's the marginal cost of losses, it's the MCL, the um, MCC is the marginal cost of congestion. So it's that part of the LMP that is the congestion component. Thank you. Okay. We have no further questions at this time. All right. Can I? We did have uh, an additional question. I'm sorry. All right. Go ahead and take the one from the line, and then I'll ask you a follow-up question if that's okay. Caller, your line is now unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, this is Jordan White from Utah. I just had a follow-up question. You mentioned that the um, CRRs are allocated only to world serving entities. Are there other options for other third-party entities, financial institutions, et cetera, to purchase those, to allocate them, control them, or is that the only – I guess I'm just trying to wonder who controls those CRRs and who's compensated for them. So they are allocated to load serving entities. They can be allocated to out of balancing authority load serving entities as well. But then there's also that um, auction process that other uh, entities can participate in. So at, first we do the allocation and we go through an iterative process to allocate those CRRs. And then whatever is left over is available for auction and other parties that are credit worthy and meet the requirements as candidate CRR holders can participate in the auction process. And, and I would note that load serving entities also can participate in the auction. They may uh, sell some of their allocated CRRs, um, so they have that option available to them. Thank you. To, this is Lipa um, uh, in the Oregon PUC. Just to follow up on Jordan's question, that allocation process, these, are, are these allocations specific to a particular node or a particular path, or how, how should we think about the point for those rights? So the CRRs are a source and a sink. So where the generation is coming in and where it's being withdrawn. So the, the load serving entities submit, they nominate source sync pairs um, and request those to be allocated and then we do a simultaneous feasibility test where we take all of the CRRs that have been requested by the load serving entities and then distribute those amongst everybody. Uh, additionally, those locations for the allocation process actually reflects the uh, historical contracts and obligations they have, meaning the source is going to be typically the generation sources, 
and the things are going to be the places where they have the load serve. That helps? Yeah, it, it helps, I think. Um, and we're we're you're charging for these because you're trying to send if i if i'm understanding it correctly you're trying to send the right signal among all these independent actors about who should be generating and who shouldn't be generating in terms of delivering the optimal system or yeah the location marginal price in, indicates kind of gives that signal not not the CRRs, if you will. The location right. price is providing those signals as to whether we really want you to generate or we really want you to back off. Can I um, can I ask a question about the uh, losses? You said they were marginal losses. Um, and so should I understand those to sort of scale up as you know, as losses would scale up as you push more into the system? Is that how I should think about a marginal loss? Uh, let me try a different way. I would say the marginal loss component reflects what is the price or the extra cost when you move generation and that movement of generation increases the losses of your system. And since we so charge... So specific to a path? Uh, it is specific to a location. Okay. Since, we, since we're settling on marginal losses, we do have an overcollection similar to what we have with the congestion component, and that overcollection is distributed back to load. And the reason we don't have like a congestion revenue rights for load is it's very sort of uh, it's not as precise of a cost causation um, as you have with where they've historically served their generation. And so it's better just to peanut butter it back. Okay. Uh, and, and just coming all the way back up to the energy cost, um, reflecting back on Wednesday, uh, I think it's slide, you showed us the demand and supply curves. Um, and the total cleared demand and that that's the marginal price. Um, is the, should we think of the RUC as on top of that? You know, the RUC sort of moved everything over, changed from the total cleared demand to what you were going to then actually give awards to. Conceptually, that's how I think of it. Um, but it doesn't change the marginal price. How, how should I think about the RUC in here? Is that? I think there are, yeah, there are two processes, mm -hmm. and they are independent of each other to some extent in terms of price. You have first the integrated forward market, which generates the scales and the prices, for which we used to settle all the transactions that happen in the integrated forward market. On top of that, you, uh, we are going to have the rock process that may lead to an incremental dispatch of some resources, and we're going to generate similarly to the IFM a set of prices which are going to be used to settle only the additional RUC award. Ah, uh, only the extra. Yeah, using yep. RUC availability bids and not energy bids that were used in the integrated forward market. Right, that's a completely separate process. So, um, a, so a generator, a scheduling coordinator for a generator could put a bid in for 100 megawatts of energy and 40 megawatts of ancillary spin, spinning reserve or any ancillary service, and then they put in an additional bid for RUC. Now, there's a whole section about resource adequacy that we're not getting into, but they, but generally that's a completely separate bid for RUC. And it's not going to move this number. So when we say, when no. we look at the locational marginal price and we think about that energy element of it, it is really that cleared price on that integrated day ahead market and, and then that the RUC has been procured separately. That's, that's helpful, if I've understood that's, that right. That is correct. Great. And then for those of us who live in the bilateral world and where our BAs, the BAs that we regulate set up day ahead, those are, those are often plans that we don't um, 
you know, we, we don't think of those plans as including promises to pay in that day ahead moment because they've made whatever contracts ahead or maybe they've, they're vertically integrated and they own a generator and they're just planning to run it. Um, can you sort of conceptually help us understand why the, why the payment for the capacity? I mean, I know you've called it an energy payment and, and congestion and so on, but this is all forecasted. This is all just getting to the plan. Um, can, you, can you sort of help us conceptualize why we're paying for that plan? So, right. So, and this is other people can add on here, but you're getting paid because you're getting committed to provide that. You're not going to sell that energy somewhere else is kind of what you're saying. Let's say you're awarded that 100 megawatts in the day ahead and you get paid for it as a supplier. That is a commitment um, that we may need you tomorrow. So we will then pay you for that. And then in real time, that could all change, but, um, and, and there's a different, a different real time settlement, but we, pay for those awards for the energy and the ancillary services and the ruck in the day ahead. So this is James Lynn and the settlement. So that if a resource is committed in the day ahead to 100 megawatts to provide energy, and then they come back in and rebid it in real time, and they get awarded again 100 megawatts, they're not getting an additional payment in real time. We've already paid them uh, the, at the day ahead price to already provide that energy. So you're, you're basically committing them to come into real time to provide that energy, but they can bid to increase their, what they want to provide or decrease what they're already committed to buy, uh, providing. That's really helpful. So we're not paying them twice. We're just choosing you, you, the load serving entities are are paying at one moment or the other, either as they commit and get the day ahead set up or as they move around in the margin at the, at the edge in the real time. Right. right. When we see the meter data um, that, of what the actual load was, then we're going to figure that out if they're going to pay more or get paid back. But yes, the, the supply that gets awarded in the day ahead is not going to get paid again in real time when they actually provide it. They already got paid the day ahead price. Great. That's really helpful. That's really helpful. Um, let me hand it back to you. Thanks for uh, indulging all my questions. And if other folks have more questions or my questions raised questions, uh, please um, feel free to take them. That's why we're here. So great questions. Um, before we move on, though, Marco, are there any other questions? To ask a question, please press pound two on your telephone keypad. You will hear notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your name as well as your question. Once again, pound two will indicate you wish to ask a question. We have no questions at this time. All right. So now we're going to move on to what's called convergence bidding. This is our other financial product. So it is a financial product, and so there's no generation, there's no physical load, no physical generation, no megawatts are actually going to flow over the grid based on convergence bidding. You also hear it called virtual bidding as well. So um, all the other ISOs also have it, and it's known as virtual bidding. We call it convergence bidding. but. As a convergence bidder, you're bidding for virtual supply or virtual demand. Um, so the terms can actually be used interchangeably, but I'll try to keep, keep with one. I'll try to say convergence bidding every time. Again, it's a financial product. So I'm going to try and go slow here, and I, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of questions. So. There's three main reasons why all ISOs have convergence bidding. I asked all my subject matter experts, and this is what they told me. It drives convergence of day ahead and real time prices. So if the day ahead price is high and the real time price is low, it brings those prices closer together. 
it leads to more efficient market outcomes where resources are bidding uh, closer to their cost or load is bringing more of their resources into the day ahead, uh, more of their bids into the day ahead market. It also eliminates the need for scheduling penalties. So on my next slide, I'm going to talk about what a virtual bidder does, what a convergence bidder does when they participate in our market. We're going to start with virtual demand. <coughs> so remember, virtual demand means that you're buying in the day ahead market or a virtual bidder, convergence bidder is buying in the day ahead market and they're going to be selling in real time. So a, a convergence bidder submits a bid to buy megawatts in the day ahead market and will see if their bid clears the market. Assuming their bid clears the market, they're going to pay the day ahead price. So let's say you're a virtual bidder and uh, a convergence bidder and you do virtual demand and you bid in one megawatt at $40 and it clears the market, you're going to pay $40. Now you have to wait and see what's going to happen with that one megawatt in the real-time market. The real-time market runs and automatically sells that one megawatt, and that bidder is going to be paid at the real-time price. So if you're doing virtual demand, you want the real-time price to be higher than the day-ahead price. That's how you're going to make money. On the other side of the coin, there's a virtual supply. With virtual supply, you can, you, uh, convergence bidder is bidding to sell megawatts in the day ahead market. And assuming that that bid clears the market, they're going to be paid the day ahead price. And then their uh, bid will liquidate in real time, meaning they will pay the real time price. So again, um, using that one megawatt forty dollar example, let's say the they bid one dollar one megawatt at forty dollars in the day ahead market. Their bid cleared the market. They're paid forty dollars, and then they wait till the real time market runs and see if they made money or lost money because that one megawatt, they're going to get paid the real time price for that one megawatt. In this situation, you want the day ahead price to be higher than the real time price if you're a, a convergence bidder. So it's important to the ISO, since there's no physical supply or physical demand, that resources, the convergence bidders that do this are credit worthy. So we have what's called a dynamic credit check. And for every bid that they put in, we do a credit check on all of their bids to make sure that they have financial backing to, uh, to uh, pay for those bids. So every bid has a dynamic credit check. Just wanted to let you know that. So we've kind of put this all together and Let's talk about what the impact is of these virtual bids on the market. So as I mentioned, with convergence or virtual bids, there's no physical energy delivered or consumed. This is all financial. And there are no physical assets. There's no generator that's going to run at the end of this process or no uh, load that's going to be consumed. They're just it's completely financial. If you're a scheduling coordinator and you have both virtual and physical bids, there's no link between those two types of bids. Now this does impact pricing. So when you think about that supply curve and that demand curve, on the supply curve, there's physical megawatts and virtual megawatts on the same on the same line, and with the demand, there's physical and virtual megawatts, again, on the same line, so they could set the clearing price. They can also, since they're part of the optimization, they can also cause congestion. And finally, they can affect that residual unit commitment that we were just talking about, and I'm going to show you an example of that. So we were talking earlier 
that we have all the supply bids stacked up. This is one hour of the day ahead market. And you can see it's the physical supply and virtual supply. The physical demand and virtual demand, they're all on the same curve. The market clears, and it could clear on a virtual bid or a physical bid. But, and then we look at our forecast of demand. What, what does the ISO actually think is going to be needed tomorrow? And in our last uh, session, I told you that the difference between what cleared in the market and what our forecast was, that's the amount of residual unit commitment that we procure. But if we take into account the virtual bids, that might move that line. So, oops, wrong way. Let's say if we strip out all the virtuals, let's say that the total clear supply demand is that orange line. So when we're because residual unit commitment is we're ensuring the reliability of the system, we strip out all the virtual bids, we're looking at the physical bids compared to the forecast, and that is how much residual unit commitment capacity that we procure. So the next thing I'm going to do is go on to some examples, but I think I might stop here before I go on to the examples and see if there's any questions. So Marco? Any questions? To ask a question, please press pound two on your telephone keypad. You will hear notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, then please state your name as well as your question. Once again, pressing pound two will indicate you wish to ask a question. We have no questions at this time. All right. Okay, everybody put on your seatbelts because we're going to go through some examples and show you how convergence bidding works. We're going to do an example of virtual supply, then we'll do an example with virtual demand. I'll stop after the virtual supply example and see if there's questions um, just to give your brain a break and also to change the scenario a bit. So we're going to start with an example of the day ahead market and there's not a virtual bid in this example. We'll add the virtual bids in later and see how it affects the market. So here we have a load serving entity. There's load that's bid in the market. 2,000 megawatts of load at $50. So that blue line says the scheduling coordinator is willing to buy up to 2,000 megawatts if the price is $50 or less. Now we're going to add in all, stack in all the supply bids that we have. So our first supply bid is at $10 for 1,000 megawatts. Our second supply bid, now we're getting more expensive, is, the, is 900 megawatts at $20. And we have a generator that's also bidding 500 megawatts at $30. So where the supply and the demand cross, that's the day ahead clearing price for energy, which is $30. So since we're talking about virtual supply, the real time price is going to be lower than the day ahead price. So let's look at the real time market and for this, for this example. Now in the real time market, remember we don't get load bids in the real time market. We look at the load forecast. We're clearing the supply against the load forecast. Now the load forecast happens to be 2,000 megawatts, the same as what was bid in the day ahead market. So we have 2,000 megawatts of the ISO load forecast. And when the first generator came to the real time market, they realized they had more generation available. So in the day ahead, they bid in 1,000 megawatts at $10, and in real time, they're bidding in 1,200. Maybe it's a wind resource, and they actually have more wind than, they, than was forecast in the day ahead. So now they're bidding in 1,200 megawatts at $10. Oops, wrong direction. And the second bid is 900 megawatts at $20, and there's that 500 megawatts at $30 for that third generator. So in this example, in real time, the real-time price for demand is $20. So to summarize, that first generator's bid quantity is 200 megawatts more than it was in the day ahead. The day ahead price is $30 and the real-time price is $20. So there's a $10 difference between the day ahead price 
and the real-time price. If you are a convergence bidder and you wanted to get in on this, you would see a virtual supply opportunity. There's a large gap between the day ahead and real-time price. So let's look at this example again and see where a virtual supply bid could be put in. So we're going back to our day ahead market, same example, 2,000 megawatts uh, load, uh, willing to buy 2,000 megawatts at the price of $50 or less. We have our first generator at $10, our second generator is bidding at $20, and then we have a virtual bidder who put in a bid for $21 for 200 megawatts, which moves out the curve and that third megawatt, that third bidder, third physical supply, is bidding in that 500 megawatt for thirty dollars. You can see that where the supply and the demand cross now is twenty-one dollars, where without the virtual bid it was thirty dollars. So the real, the day ahead price is now twenty-one dollars, and the real time price is twenty dollars. As you can see, we have more efficient pricing. We have just a dollar difference between that day ahead and that real-time price. And the load-serving entity is no longer paying $30 for those day ahead megawatts. They're only paying 21 So that's where the, the beauty of the virtual supply bid in this example benefits the virtual bidder and also the, uh, the load-serving entity. So I'm going to stop here before I move on to the next example. Actually, I'll go back here and see, Marco, if there are any questions on the effect of the virtual bid in this example. To ask a question, press pound 2 on your telephone keypad. You will hear notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, then please state your name as well as your question. Once again, pressing pound 2 will indicate you wish to ask a question. We have no. We do have a question at this time. One moment, please. Caller, your line is unmuted. Go ahead. Hi, this is Ann Rundle from Washington again. So, um, if a virtual bidder is virtual and not uh, bidding anything into the market, actually, then. Um, how can they supply that amount? I know they affect the so they're price. Not, they, they're, not, they're not actually, so they're not supplying that amount, right, because they're virtual. You're right there. And what's going to happen is it's going to be served in the real-time market. Right? So in the day ahead, we're clearing against what was bid in. In real-time, we're going to clear all the load that, uh, that is, appears in real-time, right? So we're looking at the load forecast for five minutes from now, and we're clearing against that. So that load will clear at the real-time price. And why, would, real -time. Well, why would you allow somebody who's not actually bringing anything to the market to bid into the market when you know it's going to create a differential in the real-time? Why are you allowing that to happen when it can, eventually <clears throat> it can affect the price for folks who are actually so, trying to get actual value for their for their um, asset. So I'll start with first the, the, the regulatory reason is because all the ISOs, FERC ordered all the ISOs to have virtual bidding, but it's a benefit. You can see it's bringing more efficient prices to the market and the load is, is actually saving money in this, in this example. So I think the way to think about virtual supply, it's, re it's representing physical supply in the real-time market that's not revealing itself to the day-ahead market. So in the example we had here, there was an additional 200 megawatts of output available from the first generator, but it didn't, make, didn't reveal that to the day-ahead market. And so since the virtual supply, uh, bidders see that on a recurring basis, then they can come in, they place a, a, a bid with, that, that sort of moves the day-ahead price closer to the real-time price, and both the load and the convergence bidder uh, benefit from having that additional supply being revealed in the day ahead market. Well, 
<clears throat> I can appreciate that FERC has allowed this, but I'm not sure it actually helps those suppliers who are trying to recover the cost of their of their assets. So that's a different argument, so I'll stop now. But and I think I think the key is every all of these generators are cleared consistent with their assume they're all bidding marginal costs. They're all being uh, scheduled consistent with their marginal cost and both generator one and two uh, you know do profit. What happens is that we just don't schedule the higher price resource because we know because that virtual supply is representing the fact that there's going to be 200 megawatts more coming from generator one. And there's one other point and that I want to make, and I, I didn't explicitly say this, and that is that generator one and two and the virtual bidder are going to get paid 21. Right, so the, the one that bid $10 is going to get paid $21 for that 1,000 megawatts. The one that bid $20 is also going to get paid $21 because that's how our market clears. Are there other questions? We have no further questions at this time. Okay. And I know that this is, you know, these are pretty, we tried to simplify these concepts as much as possible. So um, now we're going to move on to virtual demand. So forget everything you just heard about virtual supply, um, and because we're going to think about it in the complete opposite, uh, opposite of way. So here's a virtual demand example. Now remember, virtual demand means I'm going to buy in the day ahead market and sell in real time. So with that in mind, we're going to start the example without virtual bids, just like the last one, and then we'll add in a virtual demand bid. So in this example, the uh, load serving entity, the scheduling coordinator for that load serving entity is willing to buy up to 1,500 megawatts if the price is $50 or less. We have these same bids that we had before, and the market clears at $20. Okay. So that's the day ahead market. And in this scenario, because it's virtual demand, the, uh, the real time price is higher than the day ahead price because the load under schedule. All right, so let's look at real time. So again, we don't bid in real time. We're looking at the load forecast. The load forecast was actually 2,000 megawatts. The load only bid in 1,500 in the day ahead. The load's actually 2,000 megawatts. So now we put in our bids in real time, same bids, and the market clears at $30. So the real-time market clears against the ISO load forecast, so the real-time clearing price is $30. So now there's that $10 gap, but it's in the other direction. So let's put a virtual bid in there in the day-ahead market and see what happens. So there are two bids for load. One is physical and one is virtual. The first bid is 50, that 1,500 megawatts if the price is $50 or less. And then the convergence bidder is willing to buy up to 500 megawatts of virtual demand if the price is $31 or less. We're going to put in our uh, generator bids, that stack of bids, 1,000 megawatts, $10, $20, $30. So now the day ahead market is clearing at $30. Now you might say, well, now it's higher, but it's going to make the load serving entity want to bid more of their uh, load in the day ahead market to keep that price down. So it, it's an incentive to increase the quantity of physical load bid into the day ahead market in the future. And it also means that we don't need to have under scheduling penalties because the market is providing that incentive to, um, to for load to bid closer to their forecast. 
So if you recall, the load bids 1,500 megawatts in the day ahead, and the load forecast was 2,000, but they only bid 1,500. So it would behoove them to bid more in the day ahead to bring that price down. So I am, that is the virtual demand example. So I'm going to open it up again for questions. And Marco, are there any questions? To ask a question, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. You will hear notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, then please state your name as well as your question. Once again, pressing pound two will indicate you wish to ask a question. We have no questions at this time. All right. Um, and can I, I know uh, Lisa, can I jump in? <laughs> Sorry, I, I want to give the other Boston members a chance to ask their questions before I uh, monopolize your, your time with my questions. So thanks for your patience with my with my butting in. But can I can I say this concept back to you and see if I've if I've got it? Sure. So you said um, one of the experts there in the room explained that virtual bidding brings forward the supply that isn't visible to the day ahead market. And, and what I see here is it also is bringing forward demand. So there may be different incentives for supply or demand to hang back from the day ahead market, betting that it'll either be cheaper or more expensive, whichever they prefer in the real time. And virtual bidding, the fact that there is that arbitrage, that opportunity, you're sort of relying on human behavior to optimize, to make the most of that potential arbitrage to drive these prices closer to each other and bring out um, representations of supply or demand that are, are likely there, but are hanging back from the market for for their own reasons. That's right, and it also helps. So it helps reliability, right? Because we have a, a better plan in the day ahead because we know what's what's going to be there uh, with more certainty. I, I'll actually, I agree. Well, I, no, I I think it's the opposite of <laughs> well, a more more I would more sense of the load that's likely to be there. I think for regulators, it feels like less sense of the resources that are likely to be there because they're virtual and we tend to think about where's the actual energy and the actual gen set and, and so on. But I, I hear you on it. it. It gives you a better plan for the load. Um, I, can, I, I, can I give you a real world? Can I give you an example please. of, of uh, the CPUC has approved uh, uh, the investor-owned utilities. That one of the things that they, that they can submit virtual supply bids and what we've observed is that many uh, wind and solar resor uh, resource owners, they don't like to take the imbalance risk between day ahead and real time, so they'd rather just jet show up in real time. And so what the load serving entities do that are not, where they're not the scheduling coordinator for the resource, and, but they have, they have a contract with them, is they'll forecast their output and put that in as virtual supply. Because if they didn't, they would pay a higher price in day ahead than what they should have had the had the uh, wind or solar resources actually scheduled to their forecasted output. Hmm. That's re that's really interesting, and you ensure reliability for the virtual supply because you have the rock. The rock is sort of the final backstop that says yes, we know we have a plan that is as good as we can make it. Yep, and we also we. Um, we also make an adjustment in the residual unit commitment process, recognizing that, that VER is historically under schedule. So let's assume that we thought wind was going to be at 1,000 megawatts, um, and we thought but, load, but wind only scheduled 900 megawatts. If there was virtual supply of 100 megawatts, we wouldn't commit any additional resources because that virtual supply is, is basically representing that real-time physical supply that didn't reveal itself to the day at market. So you don't just duplicate just because they're not showing up in the market as energy. You're looking back at 
historical trends and forward at the actual weather forecast and, and understanding whether you really need, the, the ruck is more complicated than just this is where it cleared, less the less this full number. You're you're putting more nuance, data driven nuance to it. Yes, yeah, so we do generate a forecast for all wind and solar resources in the day ahead time frame. But they may not show up and schedule to that they may not schedule for their own reasons. Yep. Right. Thank you. That's really helpful. And and it it takes to the question that Commissioner Rendall raised you couldn't have just one side of this equation or the other, just the virtual supply or just the virtual demand, because then you'd get the, the gaming, and you'd have gaming the wrong, you wouldn't have balancing, you wouldn't have balance in the incentive structure. Right, so those virtual bidders are looking for those opportunities of where there are spreads in prices, and they, they put in virtual supply and virtual demand bids, um, and it helps I don't want to say balance things out, but it helps make things, prices more efficient. Great, thank you. That's really helpful for me. I, I don't know if that raised other questions for other, um, for other BOSSER members, but that was really helpful for me. Thank you for letting me re-articulate it back to you. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if you, you want to noodle on these uh, examples a little bit. And if you have questions, again, there's an email address at the end so you can send us questions. I know it's a lot, if, if, especially if you haven't seen these examples before, it's a lot to think about. So um, think about it and let us know uh, what your questions are. So I'm going to move on, and the rest of this is not, does not hurt your brain as much as these last two examples did. Um, we're going to go through some uh, less, less complex topics, and they are including the, what is the output of the day ahead market. We've talked about the inputs of the day ahead market. We talk about what the day ahead market does, but what are the outputs? So we had this picture from our previous um, session, and just to recap where we've been, our scheduling coordinators are submitting their bids day, eight days in advance, and the market closes at 10 o'clock on the day before the trade date. We have a day ahead market process that clears the market and publishes results. So one of the outputs are the publishing of those results. The scheduling coordinators are going to get their awards saying the quantities and prices of energy and ancillary services, digital unit commitment that they're responsible for. And there are settlements associated with that as well. So we have a reports, we have a, an application that our scheduling coordinators look at to find out what their market results are, how much load cleared, how much generation, what the prices were, things like that. And then there's also settlements. Another output of the day ahead market is that it's an input into the real time market. So in the day ahead market, there are energy schedules that come out. Those are a starting point for the energy in the real time market. The residual unit commitment is capacity that it, if it's awarded to a scheduling coordinator, they put energy bids in the real-time market. So again, it's a starting point for the energy in the real-time market. And then for ancillary service awards, we may need that for energy. We may need it for, for making sure that we have enough capacity in the real-time market to meet the REC, require, REC WEC requirements. Now, when we're talking about ancillary services, just to, re to um, remind you, those are our contingency reserves, which is spin and non-spin, and our regulating reserves, which is reg up and reg down, regulation up and regulation down. So all of that is, is part of the real-time market process and the real-time market optimization for every hour. Another output of the day ahead market, as I mentioned before, is settlements. So in the day ahead, we have physical energy that's settled, and it covers the cleared supply or demand for every hour in the day ahead market. There's that virtual energy, and they're going to get uh, that's awarded, and they're going to get the cleared supply or demand. Now, with virtual energy, that's only giving them half the story, right? Because they cleared, they they were awarded in the day ahead, 
to find out if they made any money, that's where they go into the real time and get the real time settlement. But virtual energy does clear in the day ad market as well. Then if a scheduling coordinator is uh, awarded any of those ancillary services, they will get settled for those, for those awarded regulation or contingency reserves. If, a, if there is a, an award for residual unit commitment and there's a price, the uh, scheduling coordinators will get paid for that capacity. And then if the ISO commits resources in the day ahead and the costs for the scheduling coordinator exceed the revenues that they get, we have something called bid cost recovery and we will ensure that they are made whole, those scheduling coordinators for the supply. Finally, in the day ahead, we have grid management fees and charges and those cover the ISO's costs. Now I'm going to go into the grid management fees in a little more detail here. And the grid management fee or charges are how the ISO recovers its costs, <coughs> administrative and capital costs from our participants, our scheduling coordinators. We have a market services charge that we charge for every megawatt that's scheduled. Um, so for all those bids that are put in, there's a charge. A system operations charge uh, for everything that flows, so that's more of the real time of uh, the megawatts of flow, looking at the meters. We have a CRR services charge, that's congestion revenue rights, that covers the auction and any CRR um, processes that happen. And then finally, and this is part of real time, but it's on the slide, is if you're an EIM participant, you also have a grid management charge, and it's made up of market <coughs> services and system operations, but it's, it's a different charge because they're not using our day ahead market. So I'm going to show you what those charges are as of January 1st, 2020. So we have our three charges, and these are in our balancing authority for market services, system operations, and CRRs. And then for EIM, you can see they have a market service charge and system operations charge. It's less than what uh, the ISO balancing authority participants get because they're not using as much of the systems as are uh, those in our balancing authority. We also have other fees. So when we were talking about bids uh, in our last discussion, the bid segment fees, so when a scheduling coordinator puts in a bid, they can put in a stair step and say uh, as the price rises, the quantity rises, and for a, for a supply bid and, and for demand bids, the, um, they're willing to pay less, they're willing to buy more if the price is less, and so they can put in stair steps of how they want to pay for how they, what they want to offer in. And so there's a fee for every one of those steps. We have something called an inner SC trade fee, and I'm going to talk about inner SC trade. It's going to be the last topic we talk about, but it's an optional service that we have at the ISO. And if uh, scheduling coordinators want to use that service, there's a $1 charge. Um, there is a $1 charge for convert, uh, congestion revenue rights bids. And for TORs, those are transmission ownership rights, there is a fee uh, for, uh, for using those. And there's also a monthly fee for scheduling coordinators of $1,000 each month. Um, so basically, if you're getting a, a uh, an invoice from the ISO, you're going to get this $1,000 charge each month. And then we also have a forecasting fee for wind and solar resources for the ISO balancing authority resources, and it's elective if you're in, in the energy imbalance market. So those are all the fees associated with all of the activity in the ISO market. So I'm going to break one more time for questions, and we're going to move on to our last topic, which is inter-SC trade. So Marco, is there, are there any questions about grid management charges, settlements, um, any outputs of the day ahead market? To ask a question, press pound two on your telephone keypad. You will hear notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, then please state your name as well as your question. Once again, pressing pound two will indicate you wish to ask a question.
We have no questions at this time. All right, we're going to move on to our last topic, inter-SC trades. So the settlement of trades between scheduling coordinators, um, they have uh, both bilateral contracts as well as uh, participating in the market. And inter-SC trades is an optional service that the ISO provides to help uh, with these, the settlement of these trades. So an LSC and a supplier enter into a contract and there's a financial transaction that happens, right? The load serving entity says, I'll pay you $40 for every one of your megawatts to produce. And so they're, the load serving entity is paying money and the suppliers getting paid money based on that bilateral contract. But as good ISO market participants, they're they're letting the ISO know that they're going to be scheduling that, that, uh, those megawatts into our day ahead market. Now when they schedule that in our day ahead market, the load serving entity and the supplier, there's also a financial settlement that occurs based on, based on that transaction that's based on the LMP. So inter-SC trades are an optional settlement service that the ISO provides to facilitate the trades between scheduling trades. So I'm going to give you an example of how this works. So we have a generator and a load, and they have a bilateral contract, an agreement for 25 megawatts per hour per day at $40 for one day, per megawatt for one day. So based on this agreement, the load B is going to pay generator A $24,000 for the supply to meet the, the need for that day. So that's one settlement right there based on their contract. So now they both go and schedule their, those megawatts into the day ahead market, and then there's a settlement in the ISO's day ahead market. So the bilateral contract, if you remember, the, the load paid the generator $24,000. So that's the first line of this. And in the ISO market, it turns out that the load serving entity had to pay $25,000 for those megawatts, and the generator got paid $26,000. So that's the, generator, that's the settlement that came out of the market. So if you net the two of those together, the load-serving the load entity is probably not very happy because they just paid $49,000 twice for the same megawatt, and the generator got paid $50,000. So this is without an interesting trade. Now, the two of them probably worked out something to hand that money back and make that transaction correct again, but you can do that with the ISO uh, inter SC trade function because we have all of that information as well. So if you look at this, the first two uh, lines are the same. There's that bilateral contract for $24,000 changed hands. The second line, the ISO market, uh, the load serving entity paid $25,000 and the generator uh, got paid $26,000. So there was an inter SC trade, that's what ISP stands for. Um, where the load serving entity let the ISO know, I, I, I want to do this interesting trade with generator A at, this, at, the, at their node location, and the generator also let the ISO know the same information. So we knew to flip the money. So as you can see here on the last line here, the load got paid $26,000, and the generator paid them $26,000. So, that's with the inter-SC trades. They, they both submitted matching information to the ISO, so we turned that money around, and it turned out at the end of the day, the load serving entity paid 23000 and the generator got paid 20000 So that's how inter-SC trades work. So now I will break again for any questions on inter-SC trades. Um, Marco, are there any questions on inter -SC trades? We do have one more topic before we leave, and that's uh, what's coming in the future for market initiatives having to do with the day ahead market. So are, if there are any questions on inter -SC trades or anything we've talked about thus far, now is the time. To ask a question, press pound two on your telephone keypad. 
You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, then please state your name as well as your question. Once again, pressing pound two on your telephone keypad will indicate you wish to ask a question. <laughs> we have no questions at this time. All right, well, thank you. We've talked about a lot over these two sessions. Um, we covered energy and ancillary services, residual unit commitment, um, all the inputs into the day ahead market, including the bids and the full number model and the outages and all of the outputs, including the settlements and what goes into the, the real-time market. Um, we also talked about our financial products. We spent the bulk of our time today talking about our congestion revenue rights, also known as CRRs, our convergence bids, also known as virtual bids. Um, we also last time talked about market power mitigation. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand it over to Don Trethaway to talk about our upcoming initiatives. So good afternoon. So just want to highlight some of the uh, initiatives right now that are they're influencing what the future of the day ahead market will look like. So first is, as you're all aware, the extended day ahead market. Um, we've, we've scheduled a workshop to be held on February 11th and 12th. We've posted an issue paper regarding the EDAM, um, and so we'll go through a series of, of workshops uh, to develop the rules around that. The, the next is our day ahead market enhancements. So this is where we're looking to improve our day ahead market by introducing a new product, an imbalanced reserve product, uh, which is there to ensure that you've committed sufficient resources in the day ahead time frame to cover uncertainty that may materialize between the day ahead and the 15 minute market. And that would be a new product that we would, uh, that would be compensated. Um, I also think that this product is what drives a lot of the benefits of the extended day ahead market because you can now uh, optimize not just the day ahead energy schedules, but also which balancing authority is going to be carrying the uh, resources to address the uncertainty across the EDAM footprint. Um, the next is on system market power. Um, so we are looking to uh, uh, address uh, issues of whether or not the KISO's balancing authority area is structurally competitive. Um, and so we are looking to develop some measures to uh, do a system-wide market power. Um, we're looking to focus on it just in the real time uh, to start, um, but we do think that there was going to be an approach needed in the day ahead time frame uh, when we go to EDAM as well. And then lastly, the FERC Order 831. This is where uh, FERC uh, required all of the ISOs to uh, uh, increase the hard offer cap from $1,000 to $2,000. And then to the extent that a bid is received above $1,000 and is cost verified, that that could go into the market optimization. Currently, uh, everything is targeted our, is, is capped at our uh, $1,000 bid cap. And so we're developing rules around how we would uh, comply with this order. Um, and so in addition to making changes in terms of the bidding rules, we have to also update uh, the various constraint relaxation parameters that we have in our markets uh, to align with that higher offer cap. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions on any of those initiatives. To ask a question, press pound two on your telephone keypad. You will hear notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, then please state your name as well as your question. Once again, pressing pound two will indicate you wish to ask a question. We have no questions at this time. All right, well, I want to thank everybody for participating. Um, it's, been, it's been really interesting actually developing the slide deck um, and learned a lot myself, and I hope you learned a lot as well. And again, if you have any questions, you can uh, send an email to customer readiness at caiso.com. And we, the first slide deck from the first session is posted on the website currently. Um, you should have gotten an email if you uh, participated in the first uh, session with a course evaluation 
I, I really would like for you to fill that out. It's really going to help us in developing our courses in the future. Want to know what you liked, what we could have done better. It also has a link to the slides. Um, and we will be posting the, we just received, as I mentioned earlier, received the audio recording, so we can, we'll probably get that posted hopefully today. Um, we'll get this slide deck for session two posted as soon as we can. And again, I'll send out evaluations for this session as well. And um, we will post the audio as soon as we get it. And with that, I'm going to thank you all once again, and have a good afternoon. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. You may now disconnect.